Joining us live in studio, Deva Mavenga, Human Rights Watch uh, representative, Mawe Tunkosana Nkoloba, is a research and communications officer with Human Rights Institute of South Africa. Uh, in fact, we joined by Gashua Brooks, South African Human Rights Commission spokesperson, and Walter Lukuleni is a P PAC secretary uh, of uh, publicity and information. The lines are always open to you. Uh, gentlemen, good evening to you, and thanks so much for joining us. You know, somebody was saying, you know, it, it's, it's in bad taste when you say happy Human Rights Day because uh, when you look at the strides that have been made and the fact that human rights in itself is a compromise from uh, the Sharpville Day uh, or the commemoration of uh, the, the events of 21st March 1960. We'll start with you, Walter, uh, from the PAC, what your reflections are. Thanks for having me. I think you, you are correct. You, you cannot have a happy Human Rights Day because it's a day on which we should be reflecting on the lost lives and also taking stock of the strides that we've made. And as the PAC will tell you that we are seeing in 2017 baby steps in the government of the ANC beginning to realize what the struggle was all about, accepting that the PAC played, played a role uh, it's baby steps. Maybe we believe that with our engagement with them, these steps would uh, leap and become giant steps in the future. Mm -hmm. But also, uh, as I was walking in Sharpville today, it's the same Sharpville that I saw as a young man. And it's the same Sharpville that uh, people were, when they were killed, was the same. You know, the, the streets are still untarred in certain areas. There's still potholes. There's still uh, matchbox houses. And the ruling party says they've delivered houses. They've delivered even smaller matchboxes. I don't know what to call them now. You know, the more we, we, we go forward, we're going backwards. You know, so basically in 2017, it's an indictment on the a ruling party that 23 years later the changes are so minimal that you you struggle you know if Robert Sobuko was to wake up today and walk the streets you would be surprised that there has been no change you know mm. I mean I think it was David Makura premier of Gauteng who said that uh, human rights needs to be deep pollen rather um, it shouldn't be a political uh, football as it were because you know everybody needs to participate in it. We need to see the different diverse cultures participating in, in these commemoration. And that's not always the case, uh, Gashua. But why do you think that certain race groups rather avoid uh, going to these national events? Good evening to you, Cindy. Well, and, and to the people at home, of course. Look, I think it's something that very important. And I think that if we're going to limit the analysis around uh, how we view days like uh, Human Rights Day, um, and we're just going to look at it from a perspective of race, um, then we're going to shortchange ourselves. I think we need to look at it from a perspective of class. We have to look at it other sort of strata that we have within society. And the reason why I say that it's so important to look at it holistically is because I think that the younger generation is starting to lose touch with these things and what is the importance of a human rights day, for example. It's for, for, for people that come emerge out of apartheid, people that understand why human rights are so important because they were denied human rights in the first instance. A lot of people were born into having human rights and that is why um, there might be a slight disconnect in terms of that. But I think that um, it's, it's a far broader debate in terms of why is it so important. And again, I think it's something that I've been saying quite often uh, on behalf of the Commission is the fact that there's a serious disconnect between what is in Chapter 2 of our Bill of Rights, of our Constitution, versus how people interpret it and live it and, and how it impacts on their lives on a day-to-day -day basis. Mm. And I mean, we're not talking necessarily about the intangible values of the human rights um, charter, if you will, uh, in terms of, you know, you have the right of association and all mm. sorts of things, but it's whether the quality of life of people has changed um, to appreciate the, the, those very rights. And I don't know, um, Deva, if, if, if in your research that is reflected adequately to say, yes, uh, baby steps or small steps were taken to, to ensure that everybody enjoys the human rights, but greater strides need to be made. Yeah, absolutely. And um, to acknowledge that South Africa is one of the best 
uh, or most progressive constitutions in the world in terms of human rights provisions. But it is the implementation that remains a challenge. Uh, we have researched and established that uh, some half a million children with disabilities are out of school, for example. So this is an area that needs uh, you know, decisive leadership from the government, uh, a provision of resources, uh, and a comprehensive action plan to ensure that no child is left out or is left behind. Uh, we have had cases uh, like the Marikana massacre. We have had cases like the uh, life as demanding uh, crisis. And more recently, uh, the social grants uh, crisis, which threatened uh, to uh, put in disarray the rights of some 17 million South Africans who depend on social grants. So all these things indicate the need for the government to continue to provide leadership in terms of ensuring the progressive realization of socioeconomic rights, but also to say all the rights should be promoted and protected in a manner that says they are interconnected and interrelated. Yeah, but I, th I think it's this biki biki might mirror uh, kind of provisions or concessions that were made in the um, constitution uh, and the fact that we started with reconciliation before we could deal with issues of economical disparities. Um, and I don't know if we have the luxury of time to take another 360 years of what colonialism and apartheid had done uh, to bring us to where we are today to rectify the situation. Why? Do you think it's a government approach that should be blamed in uh, the uh, lackluster uh, and, um, advancements that have been made in creating an equal society? In terms of socioeconomic rights, Cindy, you will never have a situation whereby just suddenly, you know, you can turn people from poverty into sort of living happy middle class lives. Mm. You know, no matter what economic and political uh, model you use, it's not just going to happen overnight. And that is why the uh, Constitution specifically makes provision for um, the progressive realization of rights. So whether we're looking at education, anything that's a, a socioeconomic in nature, health, um, you know, housing, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Yes, it is matchbox houses, and it is an indictment to a large extent that we still build um, townships outside of the workspaces of people. I mean, and that's just a fact. We see it geographically as we lay out um, our various cities that that is what the setup is at the moment. However, those people would not have had a home to live in. You know, on, at the other end. Apart from that, how do you then, when you have so many people, and if you look around Johannesburg, for example, you look at how many people are actually um, you know, dispossessed of property, how many people are homeless, how do you get those people from being homeless into a home? And, and so therefore, yes, it will take time, but yes, there is a need for speedy um, delivery, and, and we've seen a serious lack in that particular space. All right, let's take a call at Johannes and uh, Joburg. Thanks for calling. Uh, good evening to you. Good evening, I'm Johannes from Soweto. Yes, sir. Yes, I want to call on this. First, I want to correct this thing firstly. Mm. I'm not happy by calling this day a human rights day. It remains such a day like Soviet uprising. Secondly, I'm not happy about the way the people of Serbia have been treated. Look, Serbia, there is no development eh, compared to Soviet. Soviet is how develop, develop everything is there, you see. I don't know the people who are dead, the pan Afghan struggle and the BCM struggle of 1976. The ANC failed the black people. You cannot correct now after correct everything now because it is a self be and say you have to talk about this. All right, it won't be like that. Yes, what sir. What do you expect from, from, from the white people? The one people they want a reconciliation with black people. You are wasting our time. Mandela is trying to reconcile with white people, they say. It's only blessed to come, 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 keep on going to the and say, let's come together and build it. Come. They won't. They yeah, won't. no, no, that's why the argument is that, you know, black people need to be innovative and, you know, come up with our own systems, institutions, etc. But I get your point. Uh, thanks so much for, for calling us, Joannes. Albertina, good evening to you. Good evening. Um, Cindy, for us to celebrate or commemorate the human rights, Somebody has to recognize that I'm a human first. Until we face up to the people who killed the people in Sharpville, those people must apologize first. Now we're celebrating they're not there. They didn't say they are sorry to start with. And our Human Rights Commission puts South Africans last always. If an, an incident happens to a South African, they're always last on the list. But... 
tell if things happen to other nationalities in our country, the human rights is the first to look after those. Who are we? Are we recognized that we suffered in our country or are we still last even today? Yeah, Albertine, are you referring to settlers or maybe the colonialists um, in, in the fact that they got away with impunity, if you like, and the Human Rights Commission uh, is, is, is limited in, in redressing? They, they, the, the, the human rights doesn't do anything for us, South Africans. They, they are here to look at us, at our interests, but they are always putting us last. All right, we're going to have to leave it there. Thanks so much, Albertina. We'll get uh, Mawe to Nkosana Nkolomba uh, to give uh, a response to that. Good evening to you, and thanks for joining us. Hi, how are you? I'm good, thank you. That's what the last uh, caller saying, that uh, she feels neglected, if you will, in terms of uh, the protection of human rights of primarily black South Africans. Um, so, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm from an institution, which is an NGO, um, and... Basically, I think most of the work we do is, is um, NGO-led work, which is to capacitate citizens all over South Africa with human rights knowledge, but beyond that, to also make them um, be, to be able to access their own human rights. So I also do feel like there are, of course, like inherent um, human rights education problems within the South African context. Um, and and there's there's a lot of violations, uh, gross human rights violations that occur. Um, so I mean, just very recently we had the coffin assault. Um, um, but beyond that, we have a lot of of, of various other human rights um, violations or occurrences within the country. And and I do feel like so a lot of South Africans, as much as human rights have been itself a buzzword, a lot of South Africans still um, do not understand what human rights mean. Firstly, um, in the instance they do, there's also not much education, both from the government and I think just for also civil society and other multi-stakeholders in terms of how do we then access those institutions um, to seek for legal recourse, especially within the human rights um, domain. So um, I'm, I'm two-sided, I think, with what the caller is saying. Um, partly, yes, um, maybe there is a general, I think, in adherence from state um, in terms of protecting um, the general citizen's human rights. Um, mm. And perhaps the, the Limpompo um, case study would be, you know, a, a very one to centralize or to put in front the idea that almost half of the population in Limbobo is, is unemployed, right? Mm -hmm. When um, we've been almost in this new dispensation for 23 years and there were ideals um, and treaties that government uh, ratified, some of them are regional and some of them are international, which... Um, were to ensure that would never get into, I think, such a, a situation at this time frame. Um, so, yes, I feel like in terms of um, uh, a lot of South Africans accessing um, their basic human rights, mm. um, and my answer to that would be no, right? Um, because of, I, I deal with a lot of, of South Africans who are from marginalized communities. Yeah, Mawatu, um, we'll get back to you. Sorry, I just want to get up a panelist to also respond to that, that how do we take the debate forward as opposed to regurgitating essentially the fact that very little has changed and, uh, and more needs to be done with limited resources and, uh, and maybe a lack of a political will uh, in expediting uh, the progress uh, towards a, a more equal society. Well, uh, Cindy, the reality is that colonialism and apartheid were social engineering projects. When the settlers came here, they changed the landscape of Africa as a whole. But if we confine ourselves to South Africa, we will find that 90% uh, of the townships are based in the southwest of the city center. And it needed a social engineering project because you cannot reform apartheid. What needed to have happened is that even if uh, the government was saying they have limited resources, they can't pro uh, provide better than matchboxes, build them in the northern suburbs. Those guys who are in the northern suburbs who want to buy houses, let them buy land in the, in the townships so that they face the sun in the morning as they go to work and they face the sun in the evening as they come back to work. But then the realization will come. Because as things stand, the policy of gradualism, the policy of reconciliation doesn't work. In actual fact, you are coming cap in hand, begging your oppressor to accept you at his table. Yeah, it's but to deconstruct all of that, as you were saying, is mm -hmm. going to take, uh, you know, perhaps a generation or two. In, in, the, in the immediate, uh, do, you, do you call for stricter or greater policy reforms or what, what, what needs to... Immediately what you need to do is to change the laws. Firstly, you need to say that your government will not build uh, government-subsidized houses in the townships. 
those houses would go to the suburbs. That needs a change of law. It doesn't need rocket science. Secondly, what you need, you need to go to the level of saying, not only decriminalize racism, but have stricter uh, penalties for those mm. people. And, and I mean, I want to look at the paradigm, sorry, Gosho, um, with uh, Hel Helen Zilla now praising colonialism in the fact that it depends on which side of the, the fence you, you are or how you experience colonialism and apartheid, that the black experience is not necessarily appreciated or uh, given enough um, significance to, to, to deal with the social issues that we face today. There's a level of victim or victim mentality on the greater white popul uh, populace that uh, you know denies the benefits of apartheid and colonialism and thus we see the attitude of the likes of Madame Zilla. So how do we move forward to ensure again that egalitarian ideal um, if, if we're not willing to say I've benefited and therefore it's I'm almost morally obligated uh, to give more? Look, I mean, that's a very interesting question that you're asking there. Um, you know, how do we get people to be egalitarian and them coming forward and saying, let me help out in building this thing that we call this country called South Africa, right? Mm. And, and unfortunately, yeah, it is very correct. Maybe you have, but you need policies and you need laws to enact that, right? But I think that the biggest myth that we perpetuate is this idea that it's the laws that is actually scuppering this whole process. It's not the laws, it's not law that says that you're going to build matchbox houses in townships or at, uh, on the outskirts of, main, uh, you know, of the CBD. It's not the law that says that. This is, again, a situation whereby we need to, first of all, people need to understand that the Constitution, the very thing that we're celebrating or that we're remembering today, those human rights, give us the opportunity to hold our leadership to account and to say to our politicians it's not good enough mm. to chuck us on the outskirts of, our, of, of the various towns. That's the first point. The second point is also uh, issues of land, uh, redistribution of wealth. All of those things are dealt I with. I disagree, Gosho, sure, because I think bylaws and, and laws mm. generally, I'll give you an example in terms of the radius of which school you can send your child to. Mm. So if you five kilometers away, then you're sort of included in that community. Anything external um, is, is not permit, permissible. Mm. So which means, in effect, if you, if you want to go to a more affluent area, your children can't go based on these false parameters that have been put there. Yeah. But the key question that we have to ask ourselves, why when we talk about state schools, do we still talk about affluent versus non-affluent schools? Surely by now we should have held our leadership uh, to account to say that if I'm sending my child to a state school, that the quality of education that they're going to get in Alexandra is the exact same quality of education that they No, but what if I want to send my child to Santon and I live in Alexandria? No, no, that's fine. But I mean, that's, that, that is a different debate altogether because then we're talking about freedom of movement and association and all those things. But what I'm saying is the reason, the fundamental reason for why people are sending their kids to Sandown as opposed to Alex is because I'm going to get a better education, a quality of education in mm. Sandown. Whereas in Alex, uh, whether the teachers in class or having affairs with, with 12 year olds and 13 year olds, um, you know, which is, a, which is a, the most egregious form of abuse, um, it's acceptable and fine. And we live with this on a day to day basis. That for me is the concern. The constitution should be used as a means of holding people to account. Devan, your, your response? Um, Absolutely agree that uh, the question provides that basis and that the government should be a facilitator. The point that has been raised around land reform, for example, is that you do not need to wait for a crisis uh, to begin to address those issues. You need to have a framework of the rule of law, have the right institutions, and within the Human Rights Foundation begin to address and bring all stakeholders on board. Because if you wait, uh, look, what happened with Zimbabwe's land reform is not what South Africa should be going towards. But if there is no resolution on time, mm -hmm. you would end up with a chaotic process uh, that results in more violations of human rights, food insecurity, and that destroys the fabric upon which we're saying the foundation of South Africa is a strong constitution. Mm. How, how different is human rights there going to be next year if we're still wrestling with who uh, the authentic name belongs to, whether it should be Shopville Day, whether it's in a PAC um, prerogative or whether it's a government, you know, how, how different is Human Rights Day going to be next year? Well, Cindy, I'm afraid you are going to have the same situation, simply because the ruling party is not willing to accept that other people participated in the struggle. They want to appropriate the, the right to be the number one, and they will give you space, but certain space limited 
because the narrative is that we liberated you. That is how they're getting their votes. And if the narrative changes to say, but there are other people who are involved, it becomes a problem. So the policy, their policy will always remain that other parties should be marginalized. For example, today, the president of the country goes into Ginsburg to go and honor Steve Pico. Steve Pico, yes, should be honored, but Steve Pico was killed on the 12th of September. That's the day that we should honor him. But simply because this day, for him to honor the PAC would be honor them, honor them. Mm. So the only way is to def deflect the, the attention to another area. But secondly, this is why they do it. Because also, you can't go and honor the departed in a different place. You're supposed to go to their graves. Exactly what they, he, he did with Steve Bigo should have been done in Chapville. For me, the commemoration of Chapville, whether you call it Human Rights or you call it Chapville Day, is immaterial, but should happen in Chapville. So that even the international uh, uh, people should see the difference that is, that is happening as, as we speak. That not, is not happening. All right, uh,